one, we'll read the first 13, I'm sorry, uh, 11 verses. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and the people of Jerusalem were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John wore a, a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, one, uh, he proclaimed, one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. As soon as he came up out of the water, he saw the heavens were being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you, I am well pleased. Let's pray. Father God, again, we come before you. Just help us to understand what this scripture means to us. Father, help us to uh, understand that this is your word, the perfect word. Father, we thank you. And we love you. Sam, I pray. Amen. <clears throat> so we're uh, jumping in here into the Gospel of Mark. And, and some of you may have uh, your Bibles open and may have like a kind of an introductory to Mark in your Bibles. But I'll give you kind of a quick overview. Mark was not one of the 12 apostles. In fact, Mark's name that you would recognize him with is, is John Mark. And we actually read quite a bit about him over the last year as we went through the book of Acts. And so in the book of Acts, you see him in Acts chapter 13, and you see him really in kind of pinnacle on Acts chapter 17. But he was with, uh, he went with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey when they went through and did, and we read about all this and studied this over the last year. Uh, and John Mark was there. And we don't really know what happened with John Mark. It would appear that he maybe got homesick or, or, or somehow something happened. And he, anyway, he left. He left them. He said, I'm out. I'm, I'm going to go back home now. And, and so he, he went back and kind of left them there. And, and we don't know exactly what happened. We don't know the real conditions of that. We just know that as it's recorded, that they were on this trip and he left. And so in Acts chapter 17, uh, Paul says that he wants to go back and visit all the churches that he had already been to. And uh, Barnabas says, hey, that's a great plan. Let's go and do that. And John Mark pops up and goes, I'd like to go with you. And Paul says, not on your life. You're not going to do this. I'm not taking you. I'm not doing this again. Uh, in fact, it says that uh, Barnabas, uh, Barnabas and Paul had such a disagreement about it that they finally decided, all right, Paul, you're going to go to the, to the churches you've already established. And Barnabas and John Mark went to a different, a different direction. And a lot of people, when they read that, they think, oh, that's a, there's, there's a, an addition, a first uh, evolution, if you will, of a church split. Uh, and that's not, it's not what's going on here. In fact, God uses this event uh, to spread the gospel in two different uh, directions as opposed to them just going in, in, the, in the one. They did have this disagreement. So uh, Barnabas uh, takes John Mark. And what we find out about it later, and some of this is church history, some of this we collect through uh, context clues of what's going on in the Bible, but uh, John Mark and Barnabas eventually team up with, with Peter, and John Mark spends a ton of time with Peter uh, and, 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 and kind of ministering with Peter in that, uh, that capacity. And so it's thought that most of what we read about here when we, when we study the Gospel of Mark is kind of Peter's edition of these uh, stories, because obviously Mark himself, John Mark, wasn't with Jesus when all this was going on. So he's hearing this firsthand account of the apostles uh, when this is going on. Now, the other thing that is kind of neat about John Mark is he's what we believe is the earliest uh, gospel writer, the first one. And his the people that he's writing to are in the first kind of edition, the first wave of some of the some of the um, persecution that Christians are going through in, uh, in, in all of uh, the area, but specifically in Rome. And, and what, they, what we learn is uh, Nero, of course, we know about Nero. We know that he's a crazy guy. We know that he really took great joy in persecuting uh, Christians. He's the one that 
uh, is credited, now who knows what the truth is, but he's the one that's credited as starting the great fire of Rome that just devastated uh, the entire city. Uh, they, they actually, and they blamed it on the Christians, which really kicked up the persecution more. But they, the, the thought is that he actually is who, who started that. And again, we don't know for sure who started the fire. We don't really overly care too much about that. However, what we do know is that Nero had a really mean streak, uh, evil streak, when it came to persecuting Christians. And I just learned this the other day. Uh, one of the things that he liked to do, of course, we know that he would throw the Christians into the Colosseum and let them get ate by you know, lions or whatever, and, and or, or become kind of fodder for the gladiators, and uh, we know that kind of stuff. But one thing that I didn't know about Nero is that one of the ways that he really liked to persecute is he would take Christians and he would uh, douse them with uh, pitch, with tar, and then he would use them as human candles in his in his garden. He'd light the light the Christians up, and that was what would light up the garden. So uh, this is a this is a gospel wrote to a group of people who is in absolute terror there is essentially open season on christians as at the hands of, of nero there is open season people are being killed every day you go to church you're not seeing people and it's not like when we don't see someone here in oakland it's not like oh we're missing you know Lori and danny because they went down to oklahoma to be with their uh, daughter or whatever the case is uh it's oh we're missing them because they're dead we don't get them this week because they didn't make it through the week. Heavy, heavy persecution. And so it's within that context that Mark is, is writing this, trying to get at least the, the truth of the gospel to as many people because uh, that's where we need to go. And that's why he says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he immediately calls back into what Isaiah the prophet said. For so, so often, I hear kind of wrong truths uh, about the Bible, and some of those sound something like, well, that's in the Old Testament, it doesn't matter now. Uh, the, the, the entirety of the gospel, uh, sorry, the entirety of the, of the Bible, uh, I 100% believe, John, uh, 1 Timothy uh, 3.16, where it says that the scripture is God-breathed, that, that God is, uh, that it is inerrant, that it is factual, that it is true, it is, is profitable, um, that includes the Old Testament, that's not limited to any Subsection, And so when we, when we read this and we see some comment about the Old Testament, we shouldn't go, oh, well, that's the Old Testament. We don't need to listen to that. No, in fact, our Sunday school class just this morning, I believe, and I didn't get to be part of our Sunday school class. I got, uh, had a, a, got double booked this morning and, and will be uh, next, next week as well at the Christian church in town. But we're actually going back into Genesis chapter 1 uh, because we know how important uh, the Old Testament is and, and how it is, it is drawing this beautiful picture, painting this beautiful picture of what and who Jesus is. And so we come back in here to Isaiah and it says, I'm sending you a messenger uh, ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way uh, for the Lord and make his paths straight. This messenger is not Jesus, right? The messenger is, is pointing to the, the one. We see this messenger in, in, in uh, chapter or verse 4 says, John came baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming the uh, baptism of repentance and the forgiveness of sins. Now again, uh, Mark, he goes through it pretty quick. And so if we really want to understand what was going on with, with John and the context in which he was born and all that kind of stuff, we've got to consult some other sources, uh, the other three Gospels. But what we know about John is that if you were a Jew, you knew who John was. And the reason you knew who John was is because when John's father was told that he was going to have a baby, uh, he was too old. Everyone knew that he was too old, but they knew he was a good guy. And, of course, he wanders in. He, he is a Levite, uh, and he goes, into the, uh, goes to serve uh, in, in the temple, and his lot is drawn, which is a, it's not like a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Many, many priests will serve and never get this opportunity. Tremendous honor, very terrifying. So he goes into... The, 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 the whole, one time a year, you can get in there, to this holy place, uh, and he's, he's, he's to be there, and it's, it is a dangerous situation. They actually, he has a rope tied on him, because if he doesn't come out, they can at least drag the body back. If his heart wasn't pure, uh, if, if God doesn't accept the sacrifice, that this, this is going on. And it's while he's in there that he has this interaction with an angel. And they know something, the people know something's going on, because it took him so long while he was in there. 
And then when they drag him, or when he comes out, they didn't drag him out, when he comes out, he can't talk. And so now there's evidence, well, what did you see? And he can't tell them what he saw because he, he can't talk. He's been rendered uh, speechless. And he goes home, and uh, him and his wife get pregnant, and then they all know that this must be part of it because of this story. I mean, this is huge Jewish news, because this is the first time in 400 years that the people of Israel have some inclination that God is talking to them. They have this 400 years of silence, and it's in that 400 years of silence where the Pharisees and the Sadducees had grown so powerful with all their different rules and applications of the law. The actual Bible, uh, there's no like books of the Bible wrote during that time, uh, that 40 years of silence. It's, it's, it's men's law just piling on top and piling on top. And that's the law that Jesus is constantly fighting with the Pharisees. It had been 400 years since they had heard from God. And they hear from God through, through, the, through the priest and the, and the tap, and, and they know this is, this is it. This is it. And so they knew who John was. And John immediately, uh, he's, he takes a Nazarite vow. He's wandering in the wilderness. He says that he's wearing camel hair, which is completely unnormal. That is not a normal uh, wardrobe choice of that time or any time because it would be horribly uncomfortable. Uh, and he eats locust and honey, uh, which, again, is just odd. I, I, I tried to make a joke earlier that he was, he was a vegan before vegans are vegans, but I don't think... I don't think a vegan can eat a bug. It, can someone please confirm for me whether a vegan is or isn't allowed to eat a bug? I'm not sure. Uh, but in any case, let's just say he, he, would have, uh, he would have fit in very well with the Whole Foods group. So anyway, uh, so John the Baptist is, is there. He's, he's taken a very, very strict, very, very strict religious um, uh, covenant that he's not going to do this. And he's wandering out in the wilderness, and, and everyone sees him. And they see him, they say, man, this looks an awful lot like a guy that we used to know about, a guy that we used to read about called Elijah. Like, he's got a lot of it, and his dad, and they know the story, so he has a lot of information that people want to go and they listen. And when they go and they listen, he doesn't tell them, I'm so good. When they go and listen, he doesn't tell them that this is, the, this is, your, this is your five ways to a better marriage, or this is how you have uh, good children, or this is how, he doesn't give them any of that. In fact, what he tells them he says, you better be ready, because someone's coming after me who was way better than me, whose sandal I am not worthy to touch. That's what the message is. Now think about this in a couple of contexts before we move on. That message is honestly for us. That message is what we should be taking to the people. That, that we should be willing to stand up and, 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 and proclaim, hey, guess what? Make your path straight. Jesus is coming back. John wanders around the wilderness, and, and, and we don't, we have no idea what, I mean, we can tell from the scripture that it says a whole Judean countryside, people coming out of Jerusalem, he was very popular because of the, they knew who he was, but his message is a message on, 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 the, on the one who comes after. The one who's coming. Guys, think about that. This is the first time in about 400 years that the people of Israel have got this interaction from God. And I think the real travesty of the whole situation, and when I look at the church today, is I think every single day there are people who honestly believe they are having real interaction with God. That they're having real divine inspiration from God, but they haven't picked up a Bible or, or prayed in earnest. And they, they, how can you possibly understand what God's word is in your life in this divine inspiration if you don't pick up the book and read it? Every day we, we see uh, some crazy person who says, God told me to do whatever. And it doesn't take a, a very high level of intellect to go, God didn't tell you that. But unfortunately, we get ourselves caught up. It's the first time in 400 years, and this is the message John coming about. And John goes, he makes this very interesting comment, especially if you're a Jew. Because he makes this comment, he goes, this person who comes after me, I am not, I'm not worthy to touch his sandal strap. Now this is a huge deal. Okay, in, in Jewish custom, remember uh, Peter on the Last Supper when Jesus comes up to Peter and says, I'm going to wash your feet. And Peter's like, you're not touching my feet. You're not touching my feet. That's way beneath you. I, you don't, and, and Jesus, of course, looks back at Peter and says, 
no, this is necessary. Let me uh, clean you. I have, to, I, have to, I have to remove the filth from you. And then Peter goes, oh, well, if that's the case, then wash everything. And then Jesus goes, dude, you're, you're just, I appreciate the attempt here. But and he walks him back through. You see, the reason it says is that the feet are, are despicable. You would never show your feet uh, in public. You would try and, you, you had your sandals on, but you wouldn't, like, you know, put your feet up on a table or anything. That would be horrible. They're nasty. Apparently, if you're a very, very well-off uh, Jewish person, that you could, you would have a servant or a slave, uh, and when you come home of an evening, you would ask your servant to take off your shoes because even your own feet were so dirty, it was beneath you to mess with your own sandals. Now, I, I didn't know that until uh, relatively recently when I was doing this, some research on this, and, and I kind of felt a little convicted because when I come home from, from work, occasionally, I've got my steel toe boots on, and they, they, they lace up all kinds, of, and, and I'll sit down, and I'll say, hey, Selah, <laughs> help me out, because I don't know what happens, but if by the end of the day, my feet are so much farther than my hands. I don't know what, in the morning, they're real close, but towards the afternoon, it just, they get farther. In any case, John's saying, I'm not worthy to touch his feet. I'm not worthy to touch this, this, the strap of his sandal. Think about this for just a minute. John, he's the best, he's the best humans have to offer. His dad was a priest. He's born through this tremendous miracle that God spoke to the people of Israel, that his, his birth is announced by an angel. That he takes this tremendous vow and he holds it with, with complete sincerity. That he wanders around the desert side. I mean, he's. we can say, well, I might be better than that guy. But no one can say you're better than John. And John's sitting there saying, no, no, no. I'm not worthy to touch his sandal. See, what John is telling me right here more than anything is the depravity of our humanity. Guys, humans, we're terrible people. We are terrible people. Just yesterday, I got up in the morning, like I always do, and I pulled up my, my phone, and I, I got on my, uh, uh, my main uh, website where my news feed is, and, uh, and I see a picture. I, I didn't, it didn't register what I was looking at. I just, I just woke up. And, and I see this picture, and it's a bunch of people, uh, little children and whatnot, and they're kind of like laying in a yard. I'm like, what is this? And I, and, and I just... My brain was having a hard time connecting all the dots. And I read the caption, and it says, Bodies of civilians killed in Israel. Why, why you would put that on a, on any, I don't, I don't need to see that picture. I'm sorry, that's just me being a jerk. I don't need to see that picture. But the fact of the matter is, a group of people uh, decided that they wanted to launch rockets, and they don't aim at, at Israeli uh, missile bases. They aren't aiming at Israeli uh, 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 military installations. They are citizens, civilians. And that's not the only time. I've got a friend of mine uh, back when, when, the, when Russia first uh, attacked in, in the Ukraine and stuff, and uh, he's a generator technician with us at Martin Energy Group, and he made a decision that he wanted to go to the Ukraine and try and help with some standby generators so that they could help uh, get some Christians out of, of the Ukraine. And he went up there, and he has pictures of, of apartment buildings with rockets blasted through. I mean, you, you have a family who, who put their children to bed at night and, and had no idea that this, that this war between Russia and whomever was going to get to a point where a rocket was going to come and blow through their apartment. You want to know how humans are, the, the, the way humans are? That's humanity. And we can get mad about it. We can make excuses about it. I'm not trying to do any of that right now. I'm simply trying to point to is that you have people who, who when, when one engages in warfare, who decides I'm going to be in the Marines or the Army or the Air Force, whatever, I'm going to accept the, the reality that I am a target. You No one should be a target if they are a citizen, uh, a civilian, just trying to live their life. They just want to wake up the next day and go to work and provide food for their table, for their, for their family. You get a rocket. Loma. Children, women, it doesn't matter. And don't think for a second, I mean, yeah, those are, those are, those are war areas. Man, I, I don't know 
what has happened with our absolute desensitizing of, of the way we cover things, but I have, I have seen the opportunity to see video of uh, more drive-by shooting, I guess because of so much uh, uh, CCTV cameras and stuff. Uh, it would not be very hard for me to do, go and just watch random acts of violence where people are killed. We have been so desensitized. Man, humans are terrible. Humans are terrible. In fact, I would use the term totally depraved. That's humanity. And the very best of humanity, the very, very best of humanity, someone in John the Baptist who, who, who is born with this pronouncement of an angel, who follows his, his, his vow, who is, who is eventually going to have his head separated from his body because of his conviction to be honest and truthful and, and biblical, the very best that humanity has to offer, looks up and says, I am not worthy to touch Jesus' sandal. That's the difference between how great God is and how terrible we are. And until we figure out in our hearts today how terrible humans are, we will never possibly come about how great God is. And more importantly, how impressive and how amazing was it when Jesus, who looks into this, he, it wasn't that, oh, John came, so now I can come. No, it was in the middle of the 400 years of silence. It was in the middle of the, of the occupation. It was in the middle of the Pharisees and the religious elite totally bastardizing what was in the scriptures that Jesus comes and says, I will gladly lay down my life for each and every one of you. See, until we understand how bad we are, we can't possibly understand what it really means to be covered in the righteousness of God. Because what happens in America today is that we, 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 are, we have the relativism, right? Well, I may not be that bad, but I'm not as bad as that guy. I'm not as bad as this person. Well, guess what? Unless, unless you are clothed in the righteousness that Jesus himself offers, you're not good enough. You're terrible. I've, I've made many a point on how bad my heart is and, and how people will like to say, well, Jesus knows my heart. And as I've told you many times, man, that terrifies me because he knows my heart. He knows how bad I am. And he knows those evil thoughts that come into my head. And he knows that, that I don't forgive easily, that my anger is always creeping at the, at the edge of out of control and often goes there. Yeah, Jesus knows my heart. That terrifies me. Yeah, I'm pretty terrible. I'm certainly not worthy of touching the sandal. But yet Jesus says, no, not only do you get to touch my sandal, you can take my robe of righteousness and I will cover it, cover you with it. See, John was the very best that we had to offer. At least one of the best. It wasn't good enough. Guys, you're not going to make it to heaven because you're better than the person beside you. You're not going to get to go to heaven because you did something better than somebody else. You're not going to get to go to heaven because you were the best human ever. You're only going to get to go to heaven because Jesus himself made a pathway for you and you are clothed in his righteousness. And when we look at this baptism, and we'll finish up on this, but it says, In those days Jesus of Nazareth came to Galilee and was baptized uh, in the Jordan by John. It says, As soon as he came up out of the water, the heavens opened and, and the Spirit was saying like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now again, if we look at another gospel, we can see the whole interaction about the uh, uh, about this uh, baptism. But Jesus says, no, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it because it fulfills righteousness. Jesus himself. And now I, I sometimes put too much pressure on this comment. And the last thing I want is for someone to say, I'm going to go to heaven because I was baptized. Man, that, no. No. You go to heaven because you're baptized. That doesn't work. You go to heaven because you're covered in the grace of God. You're, covered, you're going to heaven because he has clothed you in his righteousness. What I will challenge you, though, is that if you're sitting here today and you say, yeah, Jesus knows my heart. He knows I'm a good guy. He knows I love my neighbor. And I'm going to say, but, but are you willing to follow through with him and be baptized? Well, Jesus knows my heart. He knows I don't need to be baptized. And again, I'm not going to sit here and jump up and down and say baptism is the only way. I'm not trying to do that one bit. What I am trying to say is that our obedience to God as evidence through wanting to be with his family, as evidence through reading the scripture, as evidence through being baptized, being baptized in, in a way that he shows, 
those, yeah, that's showing obedience. We're never going to be good enough. doesn't matter how many times we come here. doesn't matter how many times uh, we're, we're in, this, uh, in this area. Just the other day, I had a phone call. It was, it was the coolest thing. Uh, I had a phone call. Uh, actually, my wife did because she's more approachable to me, which is true. Um, but someone called my wife and said, uh, I just want you to share. I want to share the story with you that uh, our, our child wanted to, for some reason, decide they wanted to watch a, a sermon. And, and, and they, they pulled up my YouTube account and they watched three sermons. I'm like, that is so cool because I got like 50% more views that week. <laughs> three. Uh, you can sit there and watch sermons all day long. Certainly not mine. You can watch anyone's. You can, you can do all that all you want. But what makes you a Christian is the complete and utter obedience to who Jesus is. That you're covered in his righteousness, not because of anything you did. See, we're seeing that right now. Now, next week we're going to study on this temptation. And, and, and if you want, you can prepare ahead of time. If you want, read uh, in Genesis, the, very specifically, the temptation of man. And we're going to compare how man's temptation and Jesus' temptation is very different. But my challenge to you this morning, as we study what John the Baptist did, that, that I don't think anyone could argue that, that, that I am not willing to not wear whatever clothing I have on, that I'm going to put on the, 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 this itchy, scratchy uh, garment of, of camel hair, that I'm going to wander around and, not, and, and take a vow never to eat meat and, and, and to, to live on wild honey and, and, and locust. Because I'm, I'm trying to be honorable to my... I think everyone would say, well, that guy's got it. And even John says, no, no. I'm not worthy to touch the sand. So this morning, let's admit to our depravity. Submit to how bad we are as humans. And understand that even though we're that bad, and this isn't meant to be depressing, this is meant to be very exalting, because if we're that bad, Jesus loves us better than how bad we are. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we serve. Our closing song.